God has given me an amazing privilege to uh, live in one apartment with my Muslim friend, Abdul. Uh, now, when I first met Abdul, the very first thing that really caught my eye is the, uh, the extrovert that he was, the, the energy that this young student had, and that he had no trouble starting up a conversation. Uh, I was a complete stranger to him, but as soon as he saw me, he ran up to me and was like, my name is Abdul, you know, I live in this apartment, you live here too, and we just started up a conversation. Um, the more I get to know him, the more I found out that he's a Muslim, you know, so I, I showed my interest and I asked him, can you tell me a little bit about your religion, your beliefs, you know, um, and, and he gladly, like any other Muslim did, he started telling me about what their beliefs are, what their uh, traditions are, uh, how a true devoted Muslim lives his life, how he worships God, how he praises him, what pleases God, what's not pleasing God. It was very interesting. Um, and, and allow me to give you a small tour of a life of a true devoted Christ, uh, Muslim. Uh, and specifically their prayer life is what really stood out to me. Muslims waking up before the sunrise will recite a prayer before even letting their feet touch the ground. So they wake up, the sun is not up yet, they're, they're still in bed, they recite a prayer. And this prayer goes like this. They say, all praise belong to the one who gave me life, causes me to die, and will raise me up again. By praying these words, a Muslim will admit that he has no idea how he woke up. And at the same time, he has no idea how he went to sleep. But he will give all praise to God for allowing him to go to sleep and for allowing him to wake up in the morning. And at the same time, the prayer will foreshadow the resurrection. Then a Muslim would walk into the washroom with his left foot over the, the, the threshold. And it's interesting that it's left foot, not the right one, simply because Muhammad said that you have to do it that way. And as he approaches the sink, a Muslim will recite another prayer. As he does his ceremonial washing, he will recite a prayer. As he washes his hands, his feet, his face, he, he's reciting prayers. As he approaches his prayer rug to do one of the first of the five prayers, he will recite a prayer already. Then he'll recite the first prayer of the five prayers, daily prayers. And then as he walks away from the praying, praying mat, he will recite another prayer. When I heard all this, I told Abdul, if there is one thing that Christians lack today, there is praying. And not all Muslims live in such a detailed prayer life. Uh, not all Muslims are so devoted, just like not all Christians are so devoted and not all of them are prayer warriors. But we do have some devoted Christians and praise God for that. When I told Abdul that Christians today lack praying the way Muslims pray, that's when he opened up to me and said, Alex, I am so far away from being the Muslim that I ought to be. I'm so far to even resemble the smallest thing a Muslim religion tells us to be. So somewhere down the road, he said, I got disappointed in the Islamic, Islamic religion. And for the most part, it was because the Muslim people that surrounded him did not live out their life to what the Quran was requiring them. For the next multiple months, I got to witness him about the gospel, about the amazing news of salvation, and that we all have this gift of, of, uh, of Christ and the blood that he shed for us. And we went our different ways as time went on. Um, he is still a Muslim today, but I hope that the word that he got to hear, um, it, it will work in his heart, continue working in his heart.
Christians today face very similar discouragement. Many kids will be raised in Christian families that will do all the Christian things, they will go to church, they will answer the call to accept Jesus Christ in their life. But then a lot of them will also get disappointed in their belief of God. I have two statements that I wish for us today to, to concern and at the same time to answer to ourselves. Two statements. One of them is, consider, I know how to recite all the right answers when I am asked about my belief in Jesus, but in my heart I know that I am so far from Christ. And the second statement, I have done all the right things that needed to be done to become the body of Christ, to be a member of the church, but in my heart I know that I am nowhere near the body of Christ. Here's another interesting fact about Muslims. Roughly half the Muslims that live in America, they consider themselves Muslims first and Americans second. It's very interesting. They believe that their purpose of living in America is to change American culture because Americans are infidels that live their life which is not pleasing to the God that they worship. Have you ever thought about considering yourself Christian first? An American, Russian, Ukrainian, Kazakhstanian, whichever, Anian, second. It's a, it's a really interesting thought. Here's a few more beliefs that Muslims will hold on to. A devout Muslim will strongly believe that he is a specifically chosen by Allah to spread Islam in the culture that he lives in. A devout Muslim will strongly believe that one day they will be martyred for Allah's sake and through that they will exalt the Islam. Here's the best part. They strongly believe that they have the power of Allah to do it all. Now, doesn't that sound very similar to Christianity? A devoted Christian will believe that he or she is set apart from the world, and if God wills, it will be a privilege for a Christian to be martyred for the sake of exalting God. And on top of that, Christian will believe that God will provide the power necessary to do, to accomplish, to endure all this. Are we devoted followers of Christ, or do we simply recite the right answers and perform the right actions? There's one very specific action that a lot of churches practice today. And by practicing this, they inflict the worldly sorrow onto people. Worldly sorrow, which will say, feel sorry. Feel sorry for your sins that you've committed and feel the need to repent for them. Numerous times I heard on the radio preachers will say, uh, close your eyes. I hope nobody was driving when they did that, but they say, close your eyes and, and, and repeat the prayer that I'll say. You know, repeat, Christ, I, I'm sorry for my sins. I, I, I want you to, uh, I'm inviting you in my heart. I want you to live in my, in my life. And, and in the end, they'll say, if you prayed that prayer and accepted Jesus into your heart, you are now a new creation in God. No, you're not. No, you're not. Here's another scenario. A pastor or a preacher will ask everyone to bow down their heads, close their eyes, raise their hand, and a preacher will say, I will pray for you. I will pray for you, for, for Christ to be in your life. No one needs to see this. We know how it feels to be a sinner. I will pray for you and you will be forgiven. No, you won't. You won't be forgiven. Here's a popular scenario that all of us are ha have encountered at one point or the other in our Slavic churches. That is practice of calling to repentance and accepting Jesus into your heart. They will be saying, we will all stand up. We will sing the right songs, the, the emotional, sad tearing songs and if you feel that God is touching your heart come forward come forward and invite Christ into your heart or accept Christ into your heart as they say no that is not how you become a Christian the very famous verse that people like to quote when it comes to receiving Christ is written in in John chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 
It says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you read these verses, these two verses, and you say, I, I need to receive Christ, you have misunderstood the gospel. He came into his own. Who is he that came? Verse 13 says, same chapter, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word was made flesh, full of grace and truth. We all very well know the beginning of the chapter. It says, in the beginning there was word, and in the word was God, and the word was with God. It is the word that became flesh, full of glory and truth. You who are here today, if you believe that accepting Christ, the physical understanding of Jesus, if you believe that accepting Jesus is what makes you a believer, I tell you, you're on a huge slippery road today. You have a very good chance of being discouraged, disappointed somewhere down your life when the trials come in. It is the word of God that is needed to be accepted. The word of God. A man shall not live by the bread alone, but by the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is the word that we need to accept. John 8. Verse 31, then Jesus said unto those Jews that believed into him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now watch how quickly these Jews that believed in Christ went from wanting, for, from believing in Christ to wanting to kill Christ. Same chapter, 33, 33rd verse. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we've never been bondage to any man. How do you say you shall be made free? They're thinking about bondage to a man and being slaves to man. But Jesus explains that it's not about physical bondage. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is a servant to a sin. Jesus tells them, it is the sin that needs to be dealt with. The sin not whether you accept Jesus or not. Verse 37, Jesus says, I know you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And if you read it in Russian, it says, потому что слово мое не вмещается в вас. It's not Jesus that we need to find place for, for, for him and us. It's his word that we need to find place in our heart. For his word. Christ says, you want to kill me because my word won't fit in you. You won't accept my word. If you turn to John 14, verse 18. John 14, verse 18. Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you see me because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I in you. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved by my Father. And I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. To him, not in him, to him. And Judah, not Iscariot, is like, huh? Huh? Well, well, Jesus, what does that mean? What do you mean that, that you will manifest yourself in us? Well, what does that mean? He says, the disciples had the same struggle. The disciples had the same struggle that we have today. They're thinking that there's a physical Jesus that they see. That's the one that's going to be manifested in them. How, how is that possible? And Jesus clears it up in a John 14, verse 23, he says, If a man love me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come 
unto him and make our abode with him. Again, not in him, but with him. But it's the word. He will keep my words and we will abode with him. Jesus says, if you keep my words in you and you will love me and my father will love you and we will come and we will be with you, but it's the word that you have to keep. If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, Apostle Paul says, Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but, but that you were sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after godly manner, that you might receive damage by us nothing. Paul says, sent them a letter. Sent them a letter rebuking them and correcting them for the things that they did. And imagine the people of Corinth just reading this letter going, yeah, we really messed up. Sorry, Paul. You know, we, we apologize. No, that's, that's not what that says. They understood that they sinned against God. Not Paul, but God. And that they are in need of repentance. They understood that there is a need. There is a sin and they need to deal with the sin. They need to repent of it. Verse 10. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of. Meaning that if you understand, if your understanding of salvation is that you're a sinner and that understanding is leading you to cry out to God in repentance, you will never regret that. You will never regret it. But if your understanding of salvation is that you need to invite Jesus in your life and accept him, you will always be like Judah. Going, huh? And that confusion will lead you to worldly sorrow, which will lead you to death. Speaking of Judah, the Judah now that betrayed Jesus, when Judah realized what he did, it says that he repented himself. If you turn to Matthew 27, verse 3, it says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, Matthew 27, 3, then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that Jesus was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. The physical concept of his sin. I have betrayed innocent blood. Judah is not seeing that he sinned against God. He's not seeing that. He thinks that if he sinned against Jesus as a person, and if he returns these coins, it will make him feel somewhat better, especially if they accept them, accept the coins. But it doesn't, and the high priests don't even help him at all. Instead of telling Judah, Judah, you need to repent to God, they say, we don't care. They say, do as you please, we don't care. The worldly sorrow leads him to death. He then goes and hangs himself. All because of one thing. He accepted to betray Christ. Now, if you take Peter on the other side, what did Peter do? He boasted that he will never fall away. He refused to accept Lord's prediction of betrayal. He was prayless in Gethsemane when Jesus asked for support in prayer. He foolishly pulled his sword to protect Jesus. And finally, he willingly went and denied Christ three times. It's a huge list. Two Gospels state that Peter wept bitterly. And the same two Gospels also state that Peter remembered the words which Jesus told him. He remembered that Jesus said, you will deny me three times. But then he also remembered that Jesus said, I have prayed for you and that you will be converted. And Peter believed those words. He believed them. Because in Acts, second chapter, 41st verse, Peter is full with the Holy Spirit. He preached his first sermon, proclaimed, repent. Repent, it says, and then gladly, re and, and then it says, I'm sorry. He preached the first sermon proclaiming repent, and it says that they gladly received his word and were baptized. 3,000 people were added. 3,000 souls were added. The next chapter, chapter 3, verse 19, Peter's message in the temple is repent and be converted. Repent and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. My dear friends, if you were begged to come forward and repent, if the dramatic emotional songs called you to repentance, or you thought that inviting Jesus into your life 
will make you Christian, you're standing on a very slippery road. Your repentance should be from reading or hearing the word of God and understanding that the sin that we have committed, they're offensive to God Almighty. Don't think that your sins have done something to you. Think what your sins are doing to the almighty righteous God. And do you know what our sins have done to God? Our sins, my sins, have beaten Christ senseless and then nailed him to the cross. That's what our sins have done. The worst of us, our sins, have been laid on Christ so that the best of his, the best of him, his righteousness can be laid on us. And now when God looks at you, when he looks at me, when he looks at those that have repented of their sins, those that have believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior, he looks at them and he doesn't see sinner that is forgiven, but he sees a child who is clothed in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Repent and be converted. Accept God's word and keep it. Then you will, you will be God's disciple. Don't think that there is a physical aspect of Christ that you have to accept, that Christ will come and live in you. Christ wants to be the king of your life. But it's not the Christ that you have to accept. It's his word that you have to accept. He gave us everything to be his disciple. Repent and be converted, just like Peter said. If today you have a feeling that you're a Christian, don't be deceived. It's not the feeling. We're not talking about feelings. It's talking about understanding. Understanding and knowing that you're a Christian, that you're a believer, that you are saved, that you will be in heaven with Christ when he comes for you. It's knowing, not feeling. Today, we all always hear, what do you feel, how you feel? But it's not about feelings. Your feelings are deceitful. They will always lead you the wrong way. Today, you're happy. Tomorrow, you're sad. But it's knowing and understanding the word of God that will keep you and save you. Let us pray.